Hello everyone and welcome to another video for this Lead Green Associate tutorial series. Today's chapter is going to be on the energy and atmosphere category. We will be talking about increasing our energy efficiency, reducing demand, using renewables over fossil fuels, using refrigerants wisely, and of course monitoring our progress. So this follows really every lead category. It starts with establishing a baseline and then reducing our demand and then it ends with tracking our progress so it's fairly straightforward we'll see that right here in the checklist where the prerequisites are establishing that baseline and you can see the same thing here on the bottom for the actual credits you have fundamental commissioning enhanced commissioning minimum performance optimized energy performance and we'll see here in this EA category this is one of the most important categories if not the most important because LEED V4 was really designed to reduce our impact on climate change and credits are awarded uh, because of that due to the most impact. So that's why EA has the most credits in it. So let's see what some of the core strategies are. As we've seen with the credits, we start with the baseline and then form a design case around that. We do the fundamental metering and then we use techniques such as benchmarking to meet our project goals, to optimize our performance. And that's really what the design case stage is going to be. With reducing demand, we want to reduce the peak energy used rather than building more infrastructure. You don't really have to use more efficient systems if you could just reduce your demand and meet your goals that way. We want to also look at our building footprint as we've talked about in sustainable sites. A smaller building footprint is great because it uses less land, less materials, less energy, we also want to incorporate a passive design. This doesn't only mean using solar energy, but also designing the building in the way that collects more daylight and more ventilation, the placement of windows, such as east to west facing windows to collect more daylight, increasing natural ventilation, having operable windows. We also want to optimize our building envelope. This is what's known as the building shell. It doesn't only include the outside of the building. It also includes the insulation, the window glazing to prevent thermal leakage as well. Increasing efficiency, we can do the same work and use less energy at the same time, so that's what the goal there is for. But the various moving parts have to work together. It doesn't make sense to have an efficient HVAC system if you're still experiencing thermal leakage and all of that, that heat is still going to be lost. But overall, you don't want to use more energy than what's required. You don't want to have to pay more than what's required. Next, we have a demand response program. Now, this is really cool because energy utilities can actually encourage large energy users to reduce their demand during peak hours for reduced rates. So it could be during a storm, during a heat wave, or during peak hours of the day. Uh, energy utility companies will charge less if a firm will reduce their energy. Benchmarking is where we compare one set of data to another. So we can use tools such as the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. It's a popular building benchmarking system that compares one building's energy performance to another in fields such as water efficiency, greenhouse gas emissions, and energy usage. High performance building systems. They may cost twice as much, but they usually have a short payback time and they last a long time. It doesn't make sense to buy a cheap system if it's going to take a long time to pay back and if it's going to go out of service quickly. So put up the money up front, have a shorter payback time, and have a system that will last you a long time. Using high energy efficiency appliances, such as Energy Star rated appliances, they can use up to half as much energy as the conventional ones. It saves money, saves energy, saves greenhouse gas emissions. Energy modeling is where we use models and simulations to try and determine how a building is going to perform in practice. This should be used in the design stage or at least partial, partially through the construction phase and it is one of the most important things uh, we can do. Next we want to look at renewable energy. So we want to reduce our demand from fossil fuels as much as possible and use a combination of renewable energy sources. And this could be either on-site or off-site. For on-site we can use solar panels, photovoltaic devices, they're very appropriate and very flexible. You can install them on the roof, on the ground, a lot of pricing options available. There are also solar thermal heating systems where we use sunlight for heat. Wind power is another great strategy, but although it's backed by a lot of government incentives, there are also a lot of regulations on where you can and can't place them, so a firm may have to purchase off-site wind power. Uh, biomass is a waste-to-energy solution using biomass from forests or, or woodlands, geothermal energy taking in heat from the ground through heat transfer, hydropower. Uh, this is a really popular option in the United States. It could be used from usually federally funded projects 
but there are also smaller dams that that businesses or private entities may have established which have a very low impact or they should at least now there's also off-site renewable energy like those wind turbines we said before if you can't have them on site you can purchase them off-site you can also purchase renewable energy certificates or RECs which are traded uh, in, the, in an open market they could be brought sold and traded uh, let's say one credit is one kilowatt hour of energy it could be brought even if the company can't produce uh, energy on site. We also have the green e-certification program from the Center for Resource Solutions or a similar third party, which certifies environmentally friendly commodities. And then of course we have carbon offsets where the goal is to reduce deforestation and encourage reforestation. Now as we head into refrigerants, refrigerants perform heat transfer by changing a gas to a liquid or liquid to a gas. They can either contribute to ozone depletion or global warming. Unfortunately, there's no perfect solution. There is always going to be that trade-off. In that scenario, the priority is going to be on reducing ozone depletion. You can have a little bit of a global warming potential up to a certain amount. That's just the way it is. But you cannot have ozone depleting CFCs, HCFCs, which through the Montreal Protocol, we're setting to phase that out, all of that out by 2030. The solution here is to use either naturally occurring refrigerants or to cut down on your demand. And this goes back to using natural heating and cooling as much as possible. It goes down to being wise with our spacing. You unfortunately can't really avoid using refrigerants, so the goal is just using as little as possible, uh, depending on the situation. Overall, we really want to reduce stratospheric ozone depletion, and we want to prevent tropospheric ozone, because ozone is a pollutant down here in the troposphere, so it should stay in the stratosphere where it belongs and where it helps us out. So let's end with energy performance, as we always do, where we monitor our ongoing performance. This is where our commissioning, our submetering, and our building automation come in, and we compare that to our baselines. We prepare the owner's project requirements, which are basically the decisions and project goals that were set, incorporate benchmarking, monitor the progress, train building employees, and also the managers to operate in this new sustainable environment, and so that we can have ongoing uh, progress and maintenance. We also have something called the Prius effect, which is where people perform better when they see the positive impact that they're having, when they see their savings and costs, when they see the reduced impact, they're going to be encouraged to do more. And this comes from uh, people buying Priuses, of course. And then finally, we want to keep up on our yearly maintenance. We don't want to install a, a system if there's a leak in the building and there's, there's thermal leakage occurring. So monitoring our, our infrastructure is always going to be important going forward. So that concludes this EA section. You're more than encouraged to look up more on renewable energy, on refrigerants, on energy performance, because even if you're not going to use that specific information for the lead exam, it's really going to help you to make these connections, especially with the other categories like location and transportation and sustainable sites. So it can only help you keep going through the checklists and going through the information. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.